Did you know that victims' rights and defendants' rights can coexist? A common misperception exists that victims' rights are a zero-sum game. In other words, the fear is that if victims are given rights, then rights are necessarily taken away from defendants. This is not the case. In nearly every court proceeding, whether in criminal cases or civil cases, more than one participant has rights and interests at stake at the same time. Judges are routinely asked to afford rights to participants in a case and to issue rulings relating to rights that come into conflict. As Professor Doug Belouf explains, victims' rights are artificially framed as rights conflicting with defendants' rights, even though victims' rights are centrally rights against the government. As Professor Paul Cassell adds, crime victims' rights do not stand in opposition to defendants' rights, but rather parallel to them. For example, a victim may have rights to be heard, to notice, to confer with the prosecution, or to be treated fairly and with respect for their privacy throughout criminal proceedings, among others. Although at times these rights may arise in contexts that are in opposition to a defendant's rights or the state's rights, oftentimes these rights are simply asserted in situations that do not implicate the rights of other participants. Sometimes, even when a defendant alleges that his or her rights would be violated if a victim's rights are enforced, there is no conflict at all. For example, defendants frequently claim that they have a federal constitutional right to pretrial discovery that would allow them to access a victim's records, even though the Supreme Court has affirmed that there is no such right. Similarly, defendants often argue that remedies sought by victims, including redoing a sentencing hearing, would violate their constitutional protection against double jeopardy. Yet courts have found that double jeopardy doesn't necessarily come into play under these circumstances. Because these conflicting rights don't actually exist, victims' rights can be enforced without courts having to analyze them in the context of other rights. There are times in a case, however, when affording a victim a right may stand in direct opposition to another participant's rights, whether that participant is the defendant, the state, or even the media, and in those instances, the courts need to carefully analyze the rights that are being asserted. But this is nothing new. In our justice system, more than one participant in a proceeding may have rights at stake, and courts are routinely asked to analyze and afford these rights in any given case. Media cases are often good places to look to see courts engaging in this type of analysis. To take an example of one type of media case, the Supreme Court has analyzed the constitutional right of public access in the context of criminal defendants' constitutional right to a fair trial. As the Supreme Court has observed, rights are rarely absolute, and in instances where different rights come head to head, the court has to determine which right will take priority for a specific purpose in a case, under the specific facts of the case, and at a specific moment in a case. For example, if publicity might threaten the fairness of a trial, then it may be proper for a judge to order that the courtroom be closed during certain proceedings or during certain parts of proceedings, as long as the appropriate standards are met. This helps ensure that each competing right is protected to the greatest extent possible. So how have courts gone about analyzing victims' rights in situations where they may conflict with other rights? Let's take a look at an example from a case in the District of Utah. A convicted offender pursuing a habeas petition sought to amend and supplement his petition and asked for a stay of his case. The victim and the government opposed these motions. So what rights were at issue? The court analyzed the victim's rights to be treated with fairness and respect, as well as the victim's rights to proceedings free from unreasonable delay, the defendant's due process right to have his case decided, as well as the state's interest in the finality of convictions. After considering all the facts in the law, the court refused to allow the convicted defendant to amend and supplement his petition or to delay the proceedings, as disallowing amendment was necessary to protect the victim's rights in the case, which had already been delayed for nearly a decade. Of course, the analysis doesn't always weigh in the victim's favor, so let's take a look at another quick example. In this case, both the prosecution and defendant asked the judge to delay a trial date for 90 days. The victim objected based on victim's rights. The court observed that all the participants in the proceeding had important rights, but found that holding the trial within seven months of the filing of the superseding indictment would not create undue or unreasonable delay that would violate the victim's right to a speedy trial. However, recognizing the victim's statutory right and the court's obligation to ensure that victim's rights are afforded, the judge put the parties on notice that, unless extraordinary circumstances arose, no further continuances would be granted. Here the court weighed all the rights of the participants and crafted a position that harmonized these rights to the greatest extent possible. Bottom line, rights are not a zero-sum game, where enforcing victims' rights necessarily takes away rights that are held by others. Victims' rights do not always conflict with the defendant's rights or with the state's rights, but when they do, judges are accustomed to analyzing different rights and deciding which rights are dominant for a specific purpose and specific moment, while ensuring that other rights are still enforced to the greatest extent possible and preserved for the future. Now you know a little bit more about victims' rights as they exist in the context of the rights of others. For more information, NCVLI has published a number of in-depth bulletins, including one that provides an easy summary of 12 common victims' rights. These are available for download on our website in the Law Library. NCVLI can also provide more specific information and resources to members of the victims' rights community. To submit a request for assistance, please visit our website and fill out the online request form. 
Victims deserve to be treated fairly in the criminal justice system, and CBLI is here to help.